Howdy everyone, Joe here. A little different type of homebrew today. It's uh, early in the morning, for me anyway. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be making some beer. Uh, Immoladius was kind enough to send me a couple ounces of Falconer's Flight Hops and a couple ounces of Citra Hops. So what I'm going to be making today is a Falconer's Flight IPA with the base bittering done with some Chinook hops. Um, so you can see we've got a ton of grain here. Um, I started out with a recipe I found on Hopville, but decided I didn't like it very much, and um, I didn't have quite enough Falconer's Flight to make an entirely uh, Falconer's IPA. So instead, we're doing this Chinook Falconer's Blend. Uh, we're going to be using 12 pounds of Two Row, one pound of Crystal 40, uh, one ounce of Torrified Wheat, um, 1.5 ounces of Chinook for the bittering, so full 60 minute boil on that, and then a 20 minute addition of one ounce of Falconer's, and then a five minute um, one ounce Falconer's flight addition as well. So without further ado, what we're going to do, get uh, the mash water here up to 175 roughly. Uh, I've got 4.06 gallons roughly in here. That's going to be based off 1.25 quarts per pound of grain I'm using. Um, and while this is getting heated up outside on the big propane burner, we're going to get all these grains milled. So let's get to work. Okay, so we've got all those grains milled here. This is the consistency I always go for. You can see the insides of the kernels are nice and cracked, but the hulls are still pretty much intact. So you get um, really great filtration using these hulls. It's kind of like a natural, a natural filter inside your mash tun. But you're still getting all the good uh, sugars in, out of these grains when they convert. So. If you mill your own grain, make sure you don't get it too fine. You don't want it to be like this powder. You don't want it to be like that. <laughs> you don't want flour. You want just those things to be cracked. So let's go check on our water temperature and get the mash tun set up. Okay, so our water is up to 175. Uh, I've already went ahead and prepped the cooler here, the mash tun. Always make sure you've got your spigot closed on the outside and your uh, braid or your filter installed on the inside before you do this. I've missed this step before. Talk about a nightmare. <laughs> so let me see here. Let me grab some pot holders. Let me get this in here. Now obviously I don't want to, uh, my strike temperature is not 175, it's right around 172. But I typically, uh, you'll want to um, get the water a little bit hotter so that way your mash tun can warm up and you don't have you know, weird thermal loss and you know, you'll be off a degree or two here or there. And again, that's just a little bit more of a hassle. You, know? you can always adjust it with hot water or cold water, but it just, it's easier for me. You know? Crank it up a notch and uh, you can always wait for it to cool down a little bit. right? So at this point I always put in my mash stabilizer. Super easy. Done and done. It's one tablespoon for five gallons, so I just did roughly under um, roughly under a tablespoon actually. So and we'll just wait a moment or two here. No leaking. Looking good. I'm excited to give this one a try because uh, Mo was saying that those hops are delightful so I'm very excited. Thank you again for sending those to me. It's really really appreciated and really cool of you. So, um, And I will be also trying to get to a Citra hop uh, recipe here shortly as well so hopefully we'll have that video up soon too. But let's do a temperature check.
Birds are singing up a storm today. <laughs> Woo. Chickadees. I'm sitting at 171. This is perfect. So let's go ahead and mix in our grains, our dough in, if you will. Smells good. I can see where the big breweries and their fancy automated machines make this stuff a heck of a lot easier. <laughs> Makes me wish I had another set of arms. mix this up make sure we don't have any dough balls or any dry bits you want to make sure the grains all completely soaked so that way you can get the maximum amount of sugars out of it as you can and um, this is about the consistency you're looking for a soupy almost porridge like uh, consistency scoop along the bottom But be careful not to hit your braid. Mine, uh, the braid I've got screws on, so I don't have to worry about hitting it as much, but I do have to worry about actually hitting the braid too hard because I don't want to collapse it or, you know, dent it. It's stainless steel and it's pretty tough, but, you know, I like to be more precautious. Okay, so let's do a temperature reading here. There. So we're shooting for a mash start off temperature about 154, 152 to 154, somewhere around there. Looks like a chunk of barley or something. Gross. <laughs> Okay, I do have some dough balls. I'm gonna, I've got to set my thermometer down there. And you really want to make sure you don't have those, they're literally dough balls. Because what happens is you've got like your flour part of the, uh, your cracked grains, and they bind up really easily with water. See, like right trying to catch one for you. <laughs> there you go. See how it looks? This is what it should look like. This is not what it should look like. See how it's dry on the inside? So that's an easy fix. All you got to do is just uh, mash them. And from my experience, as long as you don't have like dough balls stuck to the bottom of your uh, ton, pretty easy to uh, spot because they float. And really, there's only a couple in here, so that's not too bad given the volume of grain I added and as, as quickly as I added it. You can eliminate that by adding your grains really slowly, you know. Um, but really, I haven't noticed too much of a difference. Every once in a while, like I said, I'll get these a couple tiny little ones. But as long as you just keep mixing while you're pouring, you're not going to have any problems. pretty good. Okay, now let's get back to that temperature.
And I found that um, if you take a temperature reading in multiple spots, you may get different, slightly different readings. So I, I like to check all around the mash tun. Okay, they say in Boy Scouts to be prepared. My thermometer futzed out on me, so we've broken out the trusty glass thermometer. <laughs> and um, it's sitting literally at 153. So that's perfect. Absolutely perfect. So we're going to take that, give it a nice little mix. Close this bad boy up. Now we're going to let it sit like this for about an hour, hour and 15, depending on how busy I get. Um, and hopefully I'll have that battery uh, replaced by, uh, by the time I see you next. So, we'll see you guys soon. Okay, we've had that mash going now for about an hour and 15, sitting steady at 152 to 154. Depends on where you took the measurement from within the, uh, the ton. I've noticed towards the edges, uh, mine cools down, but in the middle it stays nice and hot. So, uh, the next step is to make sure that we do have uh, starch to sugar conversions. And the way you do that, you take a little bit of a runoff here. Go nice and slow. Just to collect some of the wort. And now what we'll do, we will add a drop of iodine to this. If it turns black, you know that your starches are not converted. I mean, you don't have sugar in there. If they stay brown, you know that you've got conversion. I typically put a couple drops in. Okay, I hope you can see that. But it's staying in lovely rich brown. No darkening whatsoever. So we've got conversion, folks. Let me just put the lid back on the iodine here. And now we will begin the Vorloff. And what that is, we just basically start collecting runnings nice and slow until they run clear. Uh, what we're doing, we're essentially um, draining off any grain pieces that got within our uh, the stainless steel braid I've got running through the middle of my mash tun, and it's allowing the um, brew to essentially compact around the outside with those grain husks. So they're going to act as a natural filter to prevent all the sediment from coming out um, into my boil. So we'll just let this uh, let this drain off here. It typically takes I don't know three to four of these uh, four cup measuring cups worth to really get it running clear. Uh, once we get to that point, we'll then begin the, uh, the sparge off into our boil kettle. So I'm not going to bore you guys with this because this, this takes a little bit of time. So <laughs> we'll see you guys in just a few. Okay, as I'm sure you can see, that's running a lot clearer than it was before. <laughs> it's exactly what you want to see. Um, and it's still running nice and nice and easy, so you know you don't have any weird blockages or anything going in there. So what we're going to do, as soon as this uh, measuring cup gets full, I'm going to go ahead and attach the uh, tubing to the spigot here and let it drain down into our boil kettle. And we're actually going to batch sparge this uh, set. So we'll let this drain out completely. Then we're going to infuse it with the, um, the sparge rinse water. And then we'll do the exact same thing. Boil off and then drain into the kettle. Uh, for that draining, I'll actually have the kettle up onto the burner. So that way we can sort of accelerate the whole process and get the batch boiling quicker. So see, that's looking nice and clear there. So perfect. Okay, rather than getting that going there, we'll just set that aside for the moment. Take our tubing. And we'll just let that drain off. 
right into our boil kettle. Right now I'm replacing what we just pulled off into the mash tun on the top very easily. Nice and light across the top. You don't want to disturb the grain bed at the very bottom that you've been working to get um, running clear. So take your time. And we'll see you in just a few when we add the sparge water to this. Alrighty, do you see how bubbles are now starting to come through the drain off spout? That means that the mash tun is pretty much nearing empty. So I'm going to let this continue on for just a little while. You don't want it to foam, obviously, or just <laughs> make a mess. But I'm going to be closing this off here shortly and adding our sparge water to the mash tun. We're going to mix it all up, let it sit for a few minutes, and then begin the whole process again to collect the rest of that sweet work. But as you can see, we're doing pretty good on volume. The sparge water is going to take care of the rest of that for us. So we will see you when it comes time to uh, fill this bad boy back up with 170 degree sparge. Okay, and in we go with our sparge water. Ended up being about 3.7 gallons. I've got this at 170 degrees exactly. Anything above that and you're going to extract um, tannins from the husks, which tannins are kind of that bitter quality you don't want. So we'll give this a good mix. Essentially in batch sparging what you're doing, you're overloading this thing with water and the water is going to absorb that sugar that you had dissolved out, or well, converted from starches. It's going to dissolve into your water here and then you drain it all off in one big go rather than dealing with the fly sparging which is where uh, in my previous all grain video you saw where I added water to the top uh, through the colander. That's called fly sparging. This is bash sparging. Bash sparging is a lot faster but it does uh, impact your efficiency just a little bit but if you don't really care about your efficiency, like me, <laughs> this will work great. So I'm just going to keep mixing this for a few. Then I'm going to close the lid, just let it set for probably 10, 10 or 15 minutes. Probably shorter, actually. And uh, then we'll begin the Vorloff to get it running clear. And then drain the remainder of this into our boil kettle. Okay, so I've rearranged my setup here to start doing the Vorloff on the sparge. See how cloudy that is? You don't want that. You want it running clear. So we will run a couple of these off, pour them back into the mash tun, and then once that's good to go, I'll fire up the kettle. It's on the burner right now. And we'll just begin a direct drain off right into the kettle. So this batch, it's already about halfway full or so. We'll begin heating up. We'll get it up to boiling in no time. This new stuff that's being added will also get heated up. Uh, we'll have the boil going in much less time than if you waited to drain everything out and then, uh, and then begin burning. So we'll see you in just a few. All right, we've got the boil off running clear. So now time to fire up the propane. Get this heating up. There we go. Just to show you guys what I'm talking about. Obviously, once you've got your sparge running, the color is going to be much lighter. Your sugar content is going to be lower than your uh, initial drawings. But that's what you're going for. A nice, clear runoff. That's what you want. So what I like to do is to take my lid, because the bugs sure do love sugar. <laughs> I set it right here like this. I get this drain off. See what I mean? I try to cover it up as best I can. 
close the lid and now I just let that go until it's done and in no time this guy is going to be boiling and we can add our first hop addition. Uh, we're going to be doing a 60 minute boil with three hop additions. Pretty standard. Chinook for the bittering and falconers for the flavor and for the aroma. So once this gets drained off and this gets up to a boil, we'll come back and we'll get those hops added. We've got a little bit still coming out here, so I'm just going to let that keep dripping. Uh, we literally are on the cusp of a hot break. I had to kill the heat and get the camera back rolling <laughs> to avoid a boil over. So I've got my trusty water here ready to spray. So we'll get this up to a boil. And then we've got our one and a half ounces of Chinook pellet hops here. Just increase the heat a little bit here. We're going to be boiling in no time. Alrighty. Okay, so you see we've got this foam here building up a little bit. Got a nice rolling boil on that side. I'm going to wait to add the hops because remember when you add hops they're going to foam up pretty bad. Um, and with it being this full I don't want to risk a boil over. So you just want to make sure that you're controlling your gas. You never want to leave your brew. Alright, here's the hot break. You see that? It starts to develop larger foam. It builds up really fast. You combat that by cooling uh, your propane, you know, turning it down lower, and I give it a spritz on the top. It helps those bubbles to become reabsorbed. Um, essentially what's happening, the protein from the grain is, is, is creating this, you know, these bubbles, this foam, as it continues to boil along the bottom. And you got to get past the hot break. The hot break is when this protein gets reabsorbed down into your wort here. And you just gotta battle it for a few minutes, typically. This is exactly what should be happening. And like I said, always be close to your, uh, your propane gas control or else this thing can boil over and catch on fire, ruin your pots, man, it will be a nightmare. Okay, the hot break has passed. You see how now you've got a nice small, you're always gonna have bubbles, um, but you don't want that thick foam that continues to expand because what's happening it's not getting reabsorbed correctly. The spritzer I found helps immensely with it. Okay, perfect. So what I'm going to do now, I'm actually going to lower the heat just a little bit. And we're going to add our hops. Now, like I said, you got to kind of watch out because it can flare up again. The hops contain an oil, similarly in the protein type of genre, to, that can foam. That's looking pretty good, actually. Mmm, smells good. Okay, I'm actually going to lower the heat just a little bit more because we don't want a huge, huge boil. No need to waste gas. All right, we're going to let this sit now for 40 minutes, and uh, then we'll begin adding the falconer hops for flavor and for aroma. We'll see you then. Okay, it has been 40 minutes. We are now at our 20-minute edition of the first uh, ounce of Falconer's Flight Hops. So, without further ado, look at that beautiful color. This thing smells awesome already, and I can tell this is going to be this is going to be good. I cannot wait. There's that foam up I was telling you about. If you don't have a lot of head, you know headspace here in your uh, boil kettle, you do risk a boil over. So I always, always, always have my spritzer bottle available just in case. But it's looking like it's going to be just fine. So we are going to let that go for 15 minutes, and then we're going to let our last five minute edition of another ounce of falconers flight. Hopefully it'll give us a nice good aroma and flavor of the falconers um, and then the bittering will obviously be that chinook. So we'll see you shortly. Okay so we've got about 15 minutes left of the brew boil so now is time to add the wort chiller. 
just you add it this early to get it sanitized. So I'll set that over there. Try to get these uh, plastic bits away from the actual flame. <laughs> Always a trick. All right, in another about 10 minutes, we are going to be adding the last edition of Falconer Flight's hops at five minutes left of the boil. So we'll see you then. All right, so we're five minutes until the end of the brew. Last batch of Falconer's Flight, another ounce going in. It's looking like it should be fine, so we will see you guys at Flame Out. All right, it's been five minutes, time to Flame Out. Whoops, wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're going to get this to the kitchen sink and begin the cooling process. we got to get this down to uh, yeast pitching temperature as quickly as possible. Uh, hopefully that'll be quick. So uh, let's move everything back to the kitchen. Okay, so we've got the wort here in the sink. We've got it connected to our tap. So it's time to begin cooling it down. We're going to run cold water through that wort chiller. It's going to be very, very hot when it comes out this end, so always be careful. Make sure that it is draining into your sink, because you can really burn yourself. Like, look, you can see the steam coming off that. And we'll go ahead and take our thermometer here. I typically just set it in. Turn it on just to begin monitoring the temperature. It's going to take a little while for it to um, for it to begin, you know, cooling. I mean, it's going to be a little while. You know, you're looking at at least 20 minutes or so with the, even with a wort chiller to get down to uh, roughly roughly 70 degrees. Uh, you don't want to pitch your yeast too warm, or you're going to kill them. So we'll get this cooling down and uh, we'll see you once this has cooled down to temperature. All right, while the rest of our wort is cooling down, it's time to rehydrate the yeast. We are using some Nottingham Ale yeast here. Um, new packaging actually, it's vacuum sealed so you can tell if it's got you know air in it. If it's swollen, you know there's a problem. Um, and if you know that if, uh, if it's not rock solid, <laughs> that there's an issue. I've had this sitting out pretty much the entire brew session, so now it is at room temperature. They recommend rehydrating uh, in four ounces of water in between 86 and 92 degrees. My probe here is showing we're sitting literally at 90 degrees, so it's right in the middle, which is fine by me. I did boil the water, and uh, it has been cooling under a plastic... Uh, under the plastic there, so I know that it's nice and sanitized in there. So, without further ado, let's get this rehydrating. You pour it in, you let it sit for 15 minutes, give it a stir, and dump it into the wort. And I think in about 15 minutes, we are going to be in perfect time to transfer the wort into the fermenter and then pitch this yeast. So, mm, it's got that yeast smell to it, so hopefully, it's all is good. I try to sprinkle it as evenly across the top of the water as possible because it will dissolve down a bit. There's going to be dry pockets by the time we actually stir it in. Yeah, it's got a really good, it's like a bread smell almost. It's good yeast. Now I'll put this back over the top to make sure nothing falls in there. And we'll let that sit for 15 minutes and then it's going to be time to transfer our wort into the fermenter and get this pitched. So see you then. Okay, so there's a few minutes left until the yeast is ready to get mixed in. So now it's time to get the wort into the fermenter. Now this has been sanitized. I used iodine this time. You see, iodine does dye the inside of your uh, fermenter. So if you're using plastic materials, make sure if you don't mind it being dyed, iodine works great, but if you don't want it to look to have the yellow tinge. It is clean, it is sanitized. Uh, if you don't want that, always go with something like um, uh, star sand or using bleach or something like that. So I have always use a strainer when I've got this much hops going on. 
and I pour it through there. Not only does it aerate, but it also helps catch those hot particles, keeps it out of the brew. Okay, so I'm going to cross in front of the camera now, pick up this big old thing, and we will get to work. Okay, so you'll notice right now the hop sediment is finally starting to go through. And the reason that's happened is because as I was cooling the wort, I was stirring it kind of in like a whirlpool. Um, so what happened was the, the uh, hops settled to the middle and bottom of the uh, kettle here. So now I'm just going to continue to pour lightly. We'll get the maximum amount of wort out of this as we can. And the strainer is going to catch all those hop particles. No need to waste good wort if you've got um, a strainer. Okay, see it's starting to get really thick now. I'm only going to go a little bit longer because I can see in the bottom of the kettle it is thick, literally thick with hops. Okay, it's starting to get lumpy. I'm okay with letting that work go. <laughs> Again, this entire thing has been sanitized. So we'll just wring that through. See what I mean? You don't want that getting into your fermenter. That is just gross. Still draining off. But you can see by running it through the strainer here, it got nice and aerated, good and foamy. Let's see, where's my line? You know, we're actually sitting literally dead on five gallons. This batch ended up working out perfectly. Okay, I'm gonna ditch this. And now what we'll do, uh, I'm going to take the fermented, or I'm sorry, not the fermented, the sanitized lid here. Just set it on there. Let that uh, foam settle down just a bit. We're going to mix the yeast into the water, and then we're going to pitch it and get it, uh, get it fermenting. So, and we'll also take a hydrometer reading. So we'll be back in just one minute. Okay, now that we're ready to uh, mix in the yeast and get it pitched into the wort, it's time to take a hydrometer reading. See where this bad boy sits. So, sanitized uh, thief, obviously. I want to fill it up as much as possible. There we go. Okay, give it a spin. Let's see what we got. Holy crap! We're sitting at about 1071 on this bad boy. Uh, I bet this thing's gonna explode when it's fermenting. <laughs> Alright, 1071 it is. So now we're gonna get that yeast mixed up and pitched. Okay, time to get this yeast into suspension. And to do that, you very lightly stir with a sanitized spoon or stirring stick, whatever you like. I had a spoon and a big old thing of sanitizer since I was brewing anyway, so what better? You notice it's foaming, it's starting to uh, react. 
basically what we're doing here, we're getting all the yeast that was kind of caked at the top, getting them mixed into suspension. Um, these yeasts do uh, come, basically the yeast has a yeast nutrient already in it. Um, they are ready to go pretty much as soon as you pitch these bad boys. They are going to go to town on the sugars in your brew. So I'm just going to mix this for another few moments, but it's actually looking like all the chunks have pretty much fallen out, with the exception of the ones stuck to my spoon. You do want to stir gently. You don't need to whip these things up. I, um, it's not good for them. But a nice, gentle, steady stir. I usually scrape the sides and bottoms too, just to make sure we get as much up as we can. Okay, this bad boy's ready to pitch. Let's move the camera. Okay, so the wort is sitting about 74 degrees. It's a little warmer than I'm used to pitching this at, but given that this is sitting at roughly, what was it, 90 or so, dropping them in there, there's going to be a little bit of a temperature shock. I'm not too worried about it. Um, if the wort were much cooler, I would do the, uh, you know, add a little bit of wort to this, stir it, let it set, slowly acclimate the yeast. But I'm ready to get this done, so without further ado, let fermentation begin. And since this is sanitized, I'm just going to take a little bit, include it, get all of those yeast in there. So now what we'll do, we'll take the lid here. See, my thermometer's on this side here, so I'm going to make this match up to this side. That's on there. Perfect. We've got sanitized airlock going in. We've got the airlock middle piece. I'm going to take a little bit of the sanitizer I had sitting over here that had all of my equipment in it. We're going to fill it up to the line. Perfect. And now we're going to cap it. Airlock test. Press lightly on the top, see if it raises, and hold it to make sure it doesn't go down or anything. Great, we've got a good seal. Perfect. All right, so there we go. We've got our Falconer's Flight IPA. Thank you again, Emiladius, for sending those hops to me. I can't wait to give him a taste. And if you folks haven't checked out his channel, he's got a wealth of great brewing videos. Uh, Emiladius, click through, uh, subscribe to his channel. Very, very cool guy. Um, does some really, really cool stuff. He also has a great star sand experiment. It's very interesting. He measured the pH of star sand after durations of time, which I think is, is phenomenal because there's so much talk on the boards about, oh, if it turns cloudy, it's bad. Not the case, according to his research. So I think that's great, as my star sand always goes cloudy in about five minutes. So <laughs> it's good to know that I've been using good sanitizer. So cheers, everyone. Thanks for watching. Thank you again, Emo, for sending me those hops. We're going to be getting the Citra recipe going here soon as well. So I can't wait to give this all a taste test here and, and probably about a month or so. I'm going to want to let this one set so that way that cloudiness falls out. We may also use a fining agent, maybe a gelatin or something later on because it was pretty hazy. Um, but IPAs are. What are you going to do, right? So cheers everyone. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Five minutes. Oh shit.
All right, it's been five minutes, time to flame out. Whoops, wrong way. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, so we've got a few more minutes until the yeast is ready to go here. So what we're going to do... Oh, fuck. There we go. <laughs> There's another outtake. Oh, God. Okay, so we've got a couple minutes... Okay, wait. Okay, so... Okay, so there's a few minutes left until the yeast is ready.